Are your double for loops and order n squared algorithms just a little too slow in Python? Well, I've got a solution for you. F sharp makes it easy to do math and perform array operations, and you can run it in Jupyter notebooks, and the performance just blows Python out of the water, and it's on par with vectorized NumPy, which is in heavily optimized C. That's crazy. Plus, it's open source with a huge library ecosystem since we just inherit everything from .NET. I'm going to show you how easy it is to get complex math up and running just as you would in Python or NumPy. Let's go over the basics real quick. We keep things nice and simple by using the let keyword to bind everything. And the, these variables are immutable by default. But if we want to define a mutable variable, we can specify that explicitly. Also note that the type system automatically infers most of these types, but if you want to specify it directly, you can by putting a colon and writing the type afterward. Similarly for functions, it knows what type the function takes in and will spit out based on what you do inside of the function. But if you do need to put the annotations, the uh, parameter annotation you put in parentheses and then the function annotation goes at the end like this. We can also have multi-parameter functions and all the parameters are uh, separated by spaces. And note here that you can put things on new lines, it doesn't matter, and you can also put functions inside of functions, you can nest things. And where all of this really starts coming together is in piping, where you can put one function into another function, and you can also combine this as just a composition straight up. A few syntax things I'll mention is that there's no return statement. It automatically takes the last thing you write to be the return of the function. And when you pipe things together, you can also put these on new lines. And I guess it automatically will put the annotation next to it for you if you do it like this. So this is how we can just assemble long, complex pipelines of functions going into functions that just spit an output at the end. And this is what makes it so great. I should mention before anyone gets too scared that this scary syntax above the functions is saying that the parameters are curried. And what that useless jargon really means is that M only takes in one parameter at a time and then we'll spit out a function that takes in the next parameter and that'll spit out a function that takes in the next parameter until we get to the end of all our parameters. And where that really comes into play is that we can do partial application of the functions. So I don't know, let's say we have a wave that takes a spatial component and a time component and that'll just be sine of x times sine of y okay or sine of t and now what if we only cared about this wave at one location in time or one location in space we could say let wave t equal wave at 1.0 and now this is a function that takes in one variable after we have applied 1.0 to wave it is now the function of wave and we can put anything in for t pretty cool well we have three array like data types lists arrays and sequences each with their own caveats a different tool for different jobs which is why f sharp really starts to shine as a multi-paradigm language we can use higher order functions on all three types near identically or we could do what's common in other languages of a for loop over the array indices and mutate each element as we go along. However, if your procedure would benefit from lazy evaluation, then you might get a performance boost from using sequences instead. I find arrays to be the most versatile for math purposes, but let's take a look at some of these features in action. So in line eight, I define a sequence, one, two, and three, or we could use the shorthand over here, which would be more beneficial if we have longer arrays. We don't want to define everything explicitly. And then I try to index the zeroth element. And if you've seen other F sharp videos, they might have used the dot notation here before. It seems like they just got rid of that. But as we can see, we cannot pull a member out of a sequence. And if we try to reassign something to X, it says it's not mutable. Okay, now what about it with an array? So we can use the same shorthand, but the notation for an array is bracket and then the bars. And here we can access an element and we can also reassign an element. Perfect. With a list, 
we can access an element, but we can't reassign it. Now, if you wanna just use for loops and arrays, you have the tools at your disposal, but the real meat and potatoes here is gonna come from higher order functions, namely init and map, with an honorable shout out to collect and reduce. Let's get rid of all this and take a closer look. I'm going to use arrays for this demonstration, but everything will be identical for lists and sequences as well. So if you wanted to create an array of maybe all zeros or all ones, you can use the array.create or zero create will make all zeros. Create, you can actually tell it the value that you want, and then you have to give it a count to tell the length of the list. But I'm assuming we want to do some math to determine each element, which is where init comes into play. Now this also takes a count to give the length of the list, and then it takes in an initializer function. So you could write this beforehand, or you could use a lambda function, which I will show you in a second. So if we give it a count of 10, we could use this built-in ID, the identity function, which is essentially the index of each element. And if we run that, it gives zero through nine. Now this is identical to doing this, so I maybe wouldn't recommend the first way, but they both work. Okay, however, it's showing us that it's really just counting through the integer indices. So if we put in a lambda function, fun of i goes to i plus one, each i is just the element index number. And if we run this, we see everything has one added to it. And we can start to do more complicated things like square it, but remember, it has to be a float to square, so we can say float i square each element, and now we get each thing squared. So this really is just a for loop wrapped up. For i in range 10, do i squared, and return it as an array. And we can also do this for 2D arrays and matrices, something like this, we'll give it another length, and then we would say fun i j goes to some function of i and j just like you would do in a double for loop. And since it is just a for loop, you can also use i and j to index other lists that you have beforehand. So for the ith element in this list times the jth element in this list or anything of that sort. However, instead of indexing an array that we had beforehand inside of the initializer, what we'd often like to do is pass it in separately as an argument. Namely, the map function does this. So if we see array.map, it takes in a mapping function and then the array, and it will apply the mapping function to each element of the array that we pass in and spit out a new array. To demonstrate this, let's bind this to a value. Let it be called x, and we'll make it a 1D array again. So now we can pass x into our array.map, but first, what is our mapping function? Let's just do square root for now. So it'll just undo what we did initially for x and pass it in. So if we run both of these, we can see now it gives us x as the squares, and then it takes the square root of each element that gets passed into the map function and spits out that new array. What if we had more than one input array that we were trying to map? As an example, let's try to make a function that computes the dot product of two vectors. So if we say let dot that takes in two parameters, a and b, and we're gonna have it compute the array dot map two. So this one takes in two arrays and which will be A and B, but we need to give it the mapping first, which we can say is star. And that will just multiply each element of A and B together. Now, if we were doing something more complex than just multiplication, you would turn this into a Lambda function. So fun, R S goes to R times S. Boom. And now I guess to actually do the dot product, we have to sum over. So, so far this was just element wise multiplication. And then we can pipe this into the array dot sum method. 
And this actually brings us to a good point to bring up this pipe operator. Instead of passing in A and B as parameters behind the function, we can pipe it in in this way. So let's move all this onto a new line and get rid of A and B. And now we can take them here and pass them in with a double pipe, which looks like that. Now this is effectively the same thing as before, but it's a lot cleaner and we can chain together these pipelines. So to be explicit about this whole process, map two is iterating over these two lists in order, or these two arrays, and R would correspond to the ith element of A, S corresponds to the ith element of B, and then we can do whatever math we want, in this case, multiplying them together. And it spits out an array corresponding to each element. So this is just element wise multiplication, and then we can take that array and pass it into the sum function, and it'll return a single number. Now notice how it's all integers right now, which is the default. If we wanted instead floats, we can define it with float bracket as the type of notation. You could also say float array or float list like this, but I think if you're using array specifically, it's good to use the bracket because a jagged array will be defined with two brackets and a 2D array would be defined with the comma inside of the bracket. Um, so there is a slight difference between 2D array and jagged arrays, but um, it's not too important here. Map and init are the two main ways of creating arrays of predetermined size, but then we ended up piping it into this array.sum that condensed it into a single number. So there's certain built-in functions like that that we can use, or sometimes we can utilize array.reduce, which exactly as it says, it reduces everything down to a single element after applying the function that we want to every element of the array. And then there's also array.collect, which if we see the example here, it collects the elements together based on the function that we give it. So it doesn't necessarily know beforehand how many elements are going to end up in this array. It has to pass the condition first. And then with reduce, it reduces it down to a single number after applying the function to each element. So those are the other two main methods of producing arrays that aren't the same as the input or that we specify initially. Whenever you're trying to tackle a problem, look through the list of higher order functions because there are some cool ones like average here, things like that, but really you can get away with just using map and knit and then a reduce and collect every now and then. The last thing I'll mention before we move on to libraries is that parallelizing array methods is trivial because array.parallel is built in and it has all the same higher order functions that we just looked at. To summarize what we've seen so far, a higher order function is a function that takes in a function as our parameter, in our case, these lambda functions. And we use higher order functions to essentially hide away any for loops. This is very similar to vectorized NumPy code, but in my opinion, we have more control and this is more scalable, even though something like a dot product might be simpler in NumPy. But the fact these built-in f -sharp functions have performance on par with vectorized NumPy, in addition to being more explicit, intuitive, and scalable, is actually pretty amazing considering NumPy is written in heavily optimized C. NumPy has a lot of features other than arrays though, and we don't want to recreate all of them. So there has to be something in f -sharp, right? And there is. So let's take a look at a few of them after we get rid of all of this. In order to convince Python programmers to come to f -sharp, there's two bindings of NumPy, numpy.net and numsharp. However, both of these are relatively incomplete 
for some reason, even though NumPy is just calling Fortran or C libraries and F sharp and C sharp have great interop with C, I don't know what's going on there. I hope that they end up being complete in the future. But in the meantime, I would recommend using mathnet.numerics. And if you're trying to do any uh, AI stuff, there's diff sharp. So that's also auto differentiation and yeah, it has a lot of cool tensor features. On the data side of things, the library Deedle is good for data frames and then pure HDF is good for dealing with HDF5 files if you have a massive amount of data like I do. Now to actually import one of these libraries, we can use NuGet and we can just do it right here in the code. So if we say uh, pound r NuGet, and then let's import mathnet.numerics, hopefully it pops up. Let's do the same thing and get the F sharp one as well. I think it's optional, but they say it adds some nice features. So let's believe them and then we also technically have to open the library. Okay, we can run that and now they're imported. So if we take a look at what this offers, there's a vector class in mathnet.numerics. Okay, we had to open linear algebra as well, but once we have vector, we have all these methods and higher order functions just like arrays and lists. So we can do all those operations that we saw before on vectors. We can create matrices, which is called a dense matrix, right? We can say dense matrix dot init, give it two lengths, fun i j goes to blah, 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 all this stuff. So really using these libraries is pretty straightforward. Even though mathnet.numerics is for C sharp, it works just fine for F sharp. And that might be because they've helped us out a little bit here, but everything that we would normally do in F sharp works perfectly fine. Being able to use these tried and tested libraries, I think is really important to getting up and running in F sharp, but there's a few language features that I haven't really touched on. The big one being pattern matching, which is basically like the if statement and switch cases way cooler older brother. And just general features like that, like types, discriminated unions, records. So maybe I'll go through a few different projects that I have. I'll show you the code and try to explain some of the things that are going on.